twisted British First World War aircraft in a very dark, cavernous space in India. And this very did look. And in fact, if you look before you, you can see the aircraft flying. And before we go to fly, I would like to apologise to everyone who was expecting it to fly yesterday. Um, we're still learning how to fly it. Uh, there's no living person who has ever operated a DH-9 before, and there is a known fault on the carburetors. It's easily dealt with by knocking the carburetor with a hammer, and unfortunately I gave them a slightly too small a hammer yesterday, and the problem So we really had to work from the remains we had. Let's listen to this sound of this wonderful engine. Now this is truly magnificent because this was designed to be a strategic bomber and use, utilising the DH-4 as much as possible, new fuselage, got rid of the problems of communication by putting the pilot and the uh, observer together. But it certainly handles, I've seen a DH-4 flying in New Zealand, and for such a large aircraft, it really handles very, very well. It does. It's got the same unfortunate handling characteristics of the, the Tiger Moth, just a rather large version of it. Um, and I'm Fortunately, it is dreadfully underpowered. Um, the engine was a cobbler. It was designed by a committee of three people. Um, Beardmore, Collinger and Halford. Frank Halford became a very famous engine designer. But all these three people fell out right at the start and only communicated through letters. So each had a responsibility to design one part of the engine. And I have to say, it's one of the worst design engines I've ever come to. Well, we got it working. Now, I've done some research myself uh, before coming over here, and it had continuous engine failures. There, there were two squadrons that averaged one engine failure every seven flights, but you managed to find out what the major cause of that was and eradicate it. Well, one of the big problems it had was Conrad failures. Um, and they really never got to the bottom of this. But we could see straight away what the problem was simply due to advances of the engineering and well understanding of this kind of thing. And that is the AID inspection stand was stamped heavily on the side of the Conrad, and that's where they were all broke. So we had to make new Conrads, virtually identical to the original, but without stamped oh, stamped stamped. Now this would probably be something that was not the bleeding obvious in World War One, and yet today, with 2019 eyes, we see something different. Well, that's absolutely right. But we must also remember that this engine was designed only 10 years after Louis Berrio crossed the channel in his very homemade aeroplane with an engine built in someone's garden shed almost. 
Uh, and the advance then was tremendous. The just is that with today's understanding of the problems, uh, we can see some serious flaws in it. Well, in the DH9, like that's where they had the yes. problem. But the DH9A, you know. <laughs> they were eradicated by uh, changing the engine. Well, they, they did and they didn't. Everyone believes that the Liberty B12 engine, which was fitted to the vast majority of DH9As, was a trouble-free engine. But in fact, they had just as many failures for exactly the same reasons, lack of understanding of uh, critical parts in the engine. <laughs> um, as the DH9 did, but they managed to eradicate them due to the perhaps better cooperation, better understanding, and better facilities in America. And the DH9A would be limited to have an extreme success alongside the market. So your company retrieved both of these aircraft, and you said yesterday it was from a an elephant stable, and both of these are here at uh, Duxford today. Well, that's right. We, when we saw the aeroplanes, we saw, we, I, I realised straight away that this was a really important aeroplane to the, the British aviation story. Um, and um, in fact, this, this particular design was the first strategic bomber that we ever designed. It was the first aeroplane with bombs within the fuselage and much of the size, and it was not a single, I think it's the most produced airplane of the First World War as well in Great Britain. Um, we managed to persuade the Imperial War Museum that, to agree with me that this was an important aeroplane, and you will see today a static design which we restored to start with on display in the super hangar of the um, east end of the airfield. And that had much more original material in it than our own flying version, um, simply because 100-year-old wood that had been termite food mainly um, isn't really suitable for flight purposes. So a lot of it was used. All hardwood, mahogany, oak, and other hardwood bits of the farm were reused in this. As indeed were all metal metalwork fittings, which were in perfect condition. One of the things that you said yesterday uh, really struck a chord with me when you were talking about the uh, the drawings that were available and how you couldn't, you could have basically look at it, new bits and pieces came up or some odd bits and pieces, but those drawings hadn't been preserved and yet were, in the UK were very good at preserving Iron Age uh, artifacts. Well that's it, I mean we're still throwing away historical aviation records um, and it's actually disgraceful. We need to have much more thought and care about reserving um, for the most produced. What do you think they would have produced in one hundred? I 110% agree with you about we look so far back for preservation when there are things happening right now in front of us that we should think about. I think this will get better with more awareness than more communication between museums, authorities and so on. But I think it will get better we will look by no means Well ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I would like you to put your hands together for the beautiful DH9 making its first public display. Please go and